Oral questions by members? Member for Kamloops North Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, families are being crushed by the NDP's middle class squeeze, made worse by their record breaking inflationary deficits. A $7 billion inflationary deficit, the largest in BC's history. And what do we have to show for it, Mr. Speaker? Terrible results for families. Middle class families are seeing their paychecks shrink, earning too much to qualify for the NDP's so called supports but too little to keep up with the skyrocketing costs from housing to groceries to gas. People deserve a break, Mr. Speaker. When will the Finance Minister put an end to the NDP's reckless inflation-driven spending that's plunging middle-class families deeper and deeper into crisis? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, the question. Um, global inflation and high interest rates are squeezing household budgets in BC. I think we can all agree with that. But our philosophy, instead of giving tax breaks to the wealthy, we're actually taking action to help people with costs. And I've got a list of them. This summer, we permanently boosted the BC Family Benefit up to $250 for families. <laughs> added a $500 benefit for single family parents because we recognize the additional costs they have. 75% of families in British Columbia are getting that benefit. We have more than doubled, doubled the climate action tax credit to nearly $450 per adult and that is coming into people's bank accounts tomorrow. Tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, people will be getting the climate action tax credit. And we are reducing climate or child care costs by hundreds and hundreds of dollars for middle class families right across this province. We are actually putting an average of $900 back into families' pockets, and they are taking that money and spending it in their communities. And there's much more that we have done, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to sharing that. Member for Kamloops North Thompson, supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, after seven years and two elections, the only results people are seeing is growing deficits shrinking paychecks, and the disconnect this finance minister has to what is happening in the real world is shocking. Because of the NDP's middle-class squeeze, people are paying more while their paychecks keep falling behind. With the sluggish 0.8 percent growth for 2024, BC ranks near the absolute bottom in the country. Ken Peacock of the Business Council nails it when he says, many people at the grocery store, at the gas pumps, feel they are falling behind because they are, end quote. How much worse does the NDP middle class squeeze need to get before the finance minister admits inflationary deficits are making things worse, not better, for families and seniors? Minister of Finance. Well, I'm glad the member raised seniors because low-income seniors have benefited not only from our affordability credits, they've benefited from the $100 credit on their hydro bills, they've also benefited from the Climate Action Tax Credit. 1.5 million renters in the province, including many, many seniors, have benefited from the rent cap. But let's just talk about everyday families in BC that are paying lower provincial taxes today than under the old government. A family with two kids earning $100,000 pays $34. 4% less provincial taxes today <laughs> less. than in 2016 under the former members of uh, the members former government a family earning $30,000 they actually used to pay taxes. Today, they now get $2,500 back into their pockets. But, Mr. Speaker, we recognize that times are tough with the high inflation costs, with the interest rates, and we are supporting people. Yes, people are paying more, and those are the people that big corporations and the people that high interest earners or high income earners. But they are taking, we're taking that money, and we're investing it in people. Kamloops North Thompson, second supplemental. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, a total disconnect because far from helping people, the NDP have introduced 29 new or increased taxes and fees, collecting over $20 billion a year now that are squeezing families. Out of control taxes, out of control spending, they're driving up the cost of living, exacerbating the NDP's middle class squeeze. People actually deserve a break, but the largest deficit in BC's history is delivering zero results for them. 
In fact, the only growing paychecks are the NDP cabinet ministers, and perhaps this is the group that the, the minister is talking about, their political staff, who got a secret 17% raise just recently. They're doing all right. The rest of BC, not so much. How can the finance minister justify secret raises for NDP political staffers when ordinary families are being squeezed out by all of the NDP taxes and fees? Minister of Finance. Well, the, the member's just inaccurate with this tax. He's just inaccurate. You know, it, it's, it's when they talk about the, the taxes, they forget about how many taxes they put on people in this province. It was considerable. It was considerable. We're making different choices. We're making different choices. We're supporting people in this province. And there is one tax. It's a speculation tax, which the members have said they'd get rid of, which has put hundreds and hundreds of housing back into the province, back into benefit people, so they can actually get housing, which was difficult under the former government. And yes, adjustments were made. It was not a secret. Adjustments were made to address, address wages because there was assignment of new and increased responsibilities and pay equity issues, something I wonder if that the the opposition even agrees with. And our salaries are still, comparatively speaking, members, salaries are members. actually still lower than other other provinces right across the province. So it's no secret. We're very upfront with things. House Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, one thing that the Minister is not upfront about it was when this NDP government came to power, the government of British Columbia was, was collecting $50 billion in taxes cumulatively. Today, that number is $70 billion. $20 billion increase. And frankly, the reality is that under the NDP, everyone is falling further behind. Everyone, except for cabinet ministers and the NDP's political staff and their 17% raises. The NDP's middle class squeeze. The NDP's middle class squeeze is set to get a lot worse thanks to deliberate NDP policy choices that will drain a staggering $28 billion annually from people's paychecks right through to or, or by 2030. Now the BC Business Council says, and I quote, these policies will bring annual real GDP growth to a crawl and push the economy into a long-term recession-like condition, end quote. So why is the finance minister pursuing reckless policies that will shrink BC's economy and squeeze the middle class by turning the clock back on, on everyone's paychecks to levels of a decade ago? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And actually, uh, we are an economic and fiscal leader in Canada. Our debt to GDP ratio is 17.6%, which is less than half of that of Ontario and Quebec, two bigger provinces than us. We have the highest credit ratings in the province, in the country, I mean. We have the highest credit ratings in the country, including our federal government. And the rating agencies, they will tell you that BC's solid fiscal position and diverse, resilient economy is doing well. So those are things that never happened under the previous government. And, you know, let's, let's talk about AAA. Okay, okay, okay. I know it's hard. Members, 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 members. Let's, we are wasting time, going. members. Well, let's talk a bit, a bit what they did do. They cancelled the $14 a day childcare program and saw 10 Thousand, over 10,000 families lose childcare subsidies when they form government. It was shameful. There was a great childcare plan there, and they, they cut it. The opposition leaders, $360 million in health care cuts, the health authority cuts, it caused a reduction of thousands, thousands of MRIs, surgeries, Thank cuts you. to mental health and addictions. That's, that's, that, is, that is proven. Thank so you, they can, we can talk. I can go on, but I'm being cut off Thank here. You. But I can go on about all the things they did that made things so difficult for people in this province. Official opposition, House Leader. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. The NDP's plan will reduce the size of BC's economy and hence everyone's paychecks by $28 billion by 2030. Paychecks are shrinking. Purchasing power is evaporating. Economists are clear that NDP call, uh, policies will cut key industries by up to 20 percent, leading to recession-like conditions, fewer jobs, and declining incomes. 
By 2030, the NDP's middle class squeeze will take nearly $5,000 every year out of the pockets of British Columbians. Why is this finance minister pursuing reckless policies that will shrink BC's economy and turn the clock back on paychecks to the levels of a decade ago? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and people in BC are facing big challenges right now. And that's why we're making thoughtful investments to support people now and for the long term. I mean, the, the, we want to talk about a decade ago. That opposition member left a legacy of deficits in housing that people desperately needed to live in, in schools and hospitals that people rely on, in infrastructure for growing communities. We are investing in that. We are investing in the things that people want, the services that people want in this province, and we will continue to do that. House Leader of Third Party. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, uh, BC Seniors Advocate uh, Isabel McKenzie released a report, Billions More Reasons to Care. It's a follow-up uh, to her 2020 report, A Billion Reasons to Care, about the use of public funds in contracted long-term care homes. At the time, the Minister of Health said, quote, this has been the best two years of reform in seniors' care, but I would say we've got a long way to go. The second report shows not-for-profit facilities delivered 93,000 more hours of direct care than they were funded to deliver, and for-profits delivered 500,000 hours less care than they were funded to deliver in 2021-2022. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Health, what does he think about the findings of this report? Minister of Health. Well, uh, thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. The report uh, demonstrates the effectiveness of the action taken. When I became Minister of Health in 2017, this was in the Seniors Advocate report, 85% of care homes didn't meet provincial standards. Today, they all do. BC's record, it was a very difficult time during COVID-19 in long-term care, but BC's record was the best in Canada because we worked with all providers, public and private, to ensure the quality of care. We, we brought in wage levelling to raise up uh, workers' standards for workers in long-term care. And yes, Honourable Speaker, we got rid of Bill 29 and 94, which discriminated against health care workers during that time. Third party, House Leader Supplemental. Well, the Minister doesn't address the hundreds of thousands of uh, care, uh, hours of funded care that are not being delivered by the for-profit market. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, under this minister's watch, we've seen more uh, of these public services shift into the hands of corporations who are viewing the people of this province, in this case our elders, as a commodity and a profit centre. This latest report found for-profit centres spent 66 percent more, 60 cents more per bed on building costs than the uh, not-for-profit facilities. And for-profit facilities earned seven times as much profit as their not-for-profit counterparts. These, publicly, these are publicly funded services, and the report outlines four recommendations. One, ensuring funding is spent on care. Two, improve monitoring and reporting for compliance. Three, define profit. And four, make revenues and expenditures for publicly funded care homes available to the public. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Health, will he immediately implement all of these recommendations? Minister of Health. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. In fact, uh, we are putting in place a contract model working with all providers public, non-profit and for-profit providers working together as we did during COVID-19. With respect to investment in public care, however, in the 10 years before I became Minister of Health, over 10 years, health capital funding for long-term care was $17.8 million over 10 years, or $1.78 million a year. In our current plan, it's $2 billion and $39. We are building new projects in this region, Honourable Speaker in Abbotsford, Honourable Speaker, in the interior, in the north coming, Honourable Speaker. We are adding service, and in addition to that, through our HCAP, HCAP program, more than 6,500 new health care workers. One of the key ways that you ensure funded beds and care is at the bedside is to train health care workers, and that's exactly what we've been doing. Fourth Party House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I stand here today as a distraught father and grandfather. I stand here with parents in Abbotsford who are deeply concerned about sexually graphic and explicit content available in certain fictional books within our public school libraries to children as young as 11 years of age. 
Mr. Speaker, I would ask that the House brace themselves for the following words from one such book called Eleanor Park, and I quote, I know you're a slut, you smell like cum, nothing but a bitch in heat. M M member. End quote. Member, please do not use that kind of language. I apologize, Mr. Speaker, and I actually would retract those words. Mr. Speaker, this language is deeply disturbing. As a grandfather, it shakes me to the core when I imagine that children could be exposed to this deeply disturbing, degrading language in British Columbia Public Schools libraries. Mr. Speaker, will this NDP Premier please answer to concerned parents, grandparents and families in Abbotsford and throughout this province, why is the sexually explicit book, Eleanor and Park, and others like it, available in British Columbia public schools for children as young as 11 years of age. Of education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just want to say, uh, not just as a minister of education, but also as a parent, that our schools are places which are, we want to make it, they, they are spaces which are safe, inclusive, and welcoming for all students. And the teachers are using resources that are age appropriate, audience appropriate, to give, give those values, give those teachings that are so important to, to create those welcoming environments. So I just want to reiterate this, Mr. Speaker, that the resources that teachers are imparting, that teachers are teaching, are age appropriate and they are audience appropriate. Party Health Leader Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm asking as a parent, as a grandparent, to the Premier, to the Minister, if the words I just read were inappropriate and unacceptable and clearly disturbing to this House, how is it that those same words are appropriate to be read by a sixth grader as young as 11 years of old in our public system? How are those words safe and inclusive? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I cannot comment on the particular books uh, I'm, uh, that the member is mentioning, but I can talk as a parent whose children are going to the public school system, who have gone through the public school system, and I have never encountered anything inappropriate being taught to my children. And I, I take such pride in our public education system. I am so proud of the teachers who are working every day I, in fact, raise my hands to all the work that is happening in our schools. Our schools are more, are very diverse places, Mr. Speaker, and as leaders, as school leaders, it is our responsibility that we respect that diversity and we, we are making our schools as safe as possible. Member for Prince George Vale Mount. Families across this province are struggling as the NDP relentlessly squeezes the middle class with a ballooning deficit and shrinking paychecks. As a result, financial stress among parents in British Columbia is skyrocketing. Two-thirds of those parents now stress over essential things like groceries or gas, and that is up 19% from last year. Clearly, people are feeling the NDP's middle class squeeze more than ever. So will the finance minister get up today and explain why she is happy to give NDP political staffers a 17% raise while middle class mums and dads across this province are overwhelmed with financial stress? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, and we agree that there is tough times right now because of, of inflation, uh, the global economy, things that are happening a, across, across the country, not only in BC. And that is why we are putting support out there for, for parents. That is why we've increased our BC family benefit. That is why we've, we've made supports for single moms, an extra $500 dollars to support them, because we recognize that. You know, that is why we did things like making sure communities had the supports 
they need because we recognize they need that support. I mean, you just have to talk to people anywhere in the province and what they say to me is we want to make sure we get our services, that our services aren't cut, and that's exactly what we're doing. We are not going to make cuts to people's services. We are going to continue to support them to ensure they get those services. They want to see hospitals. They want to see schools. They want to see those supports, and that's exactly what we're doing. Member for Prince George Wilmont Supplemental. Well, doubling BC's debt in six and a half years, the largest deficit in BC's history, a growing list of 29 NDP taxes, and se secret 17% raises for NDP political staff, that's the record of this finance minister and this government. The, the only thing shrinking are British Columbians' paychecks, and that's because of specific policies by the NDP government. It is no wonder that half of British Columbians are living paycheck to paycheck, and they are just $200 away from being able to pay their bills every single month. When will the finance minister do the right thing and give British Columbians the break they deserve? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And actually, we, you know, I recognize that times are tough, and that's why we are investing in people. Unlike the former government, we are actually investing in people in this province. We've been doing it since 2017, and we're going to continue to do it. In fact, we did it during COVID, and we came out of COVID with one of the strongest economies in the province. But are people struggling? Yes, they are. And that's why we're putting those, those very significant supports in place to ensure that we can help people, ensure that we can help them with the very costs the members speaking about and we're focused on those people's priorities. One of the things we heard is people wanted to invest in hospitals, in schools, things that hadn't been invested in for years. They wanted us to invest in communities. So we did. We invested in every single community in this province. So I'm asking the members opposite. Would the member from Prince George, would she say that the community of Prince George shouldn't have got over $12 million to invest in that community? Would the members from Kamloops say that, you know, they should Shouldn't have, we shouldn't have invested over $15 million to support the people of Kamloops. You know, we, we need to talk about that. We need to say we invested over a billion dollars in communities in this province. And we know that that is supporting people because the people, the, well, we just all had UBCM, and I think every minister heard how beneficial that those grants were to their communities. Member for Surrey White Rock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the NDP fuels inflation with a $7 billion deficit, the middle class is getting squeezed. Incomes are stagnant and everything essential, housing, gas, groceries, are more expensive than ever under this NDP government. In Surrey, the food bank is the latest casualty. In the NDP's middle class squeeze, it is facing a $50,000 monthly shortfall and a surge of first time desperate visitors. How long will this finance minister ignore real-life consequences of the NDP squeeze on middle-class families that are sending these families to the food bank? Minister of Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all want people to have what they need in order to have a good life, to be able to get ahead. That's why our government's been investing in people from day one. And despite all those investments, the impact of global inflation has been a very hard hit, and particularly the tremendously, terribly increased price of food. That's why we've made unprecedented investments, along with our food security, food emergency providing partners, uh, $49 million in this year alone. And food banks across the, the province are, are partnering with us. And whether they're investing in refrigeration infrastructure to be able to get more fresh available food to their clients, or whether they're working through our funding uh, to help them purchase and, and increase their operations, uh, we're directly funding food bank providers to be able to get vulnerable people the food and the nutrition that they need. Surrey White Rock Supplemental. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I challenge that minister to go down to the Surrey Food Bank and give them that answer that she just gave. VJ Nadu from the Surrey Food Bank says, and I quote, when I joined, we used to do maybe 150 households every day. Now it's 250 plus households 
every day, end quote. Everything from gas to housing to groceries is squeezing families in British Columbia. How many more people will have to line up at the food bank because of this NDP squeeze on the middle class? Minister of Social Development and Poverty Reduction. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are hearing directly from people on the front line, as are uh, people in, on the front lines across the entire country about uh, the terribly inc increased price of food. This is global inflation, global supply chain issues that have driven up the price at the grocery store. And that's why, as a government, we have responded. That's why we're directly funding food bank operators. That's why, with them, we are investing in refrigeration trucks and walk-in coolers so that they can redistribute free food to people in need. That's why we're working with the United Way to, uh, to design new systems and a cross-government approach through every ministry uh, to help people handle the increased cost of food. That's why we have increased social assistance payments five times. That's why we have increased the minimum wage five times since we formed government so that people have the money that they um, in their pockets to be able to get by for them and their families. And when they can't, then we support vulnerable people in need. That's the work we're doing every day. Member for Kelowna Mission. BC economists are ringing the alarm bells as people's paychecks are set to plummet this year and next and next and next. Financial hits rarely seen outside of a recession. Yet the NDP's answer to the middle class squeeze is to give partisan NDP political staff a secret 17% raise. This is beyond out of touch when over half of British Columbians are just $200 away from not being able to pay their bills each month. When will the finance minister rein in the NDP's disastrous inflationary deficit causing the middle class squeeze? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it seems that some people are out of touch across the way. They don't realize that there's um, global issues. I mean, there, there's high inflation rates. I mean, it, it is causing some issues across the country and Canada as well as internationally. But we are doing things for people because we know we are hearing the issues. We are hearing them. And, and I think the one thing that we have done that, I'm, I, that I know has put more money back into people's pockets than anything is our childcare. You know, we, we have an average of $900 a month. That is, the highest, that is the highest tax cut in the history of British Columbia. Over almost. Think about it, almost $900 a month, Mr. Speaker, going back into people's pockets. Because, and what they're doing with that, they're not investing offshore or doing, they are investing right back in their local communities. They are going to the local stores, they are going to the, you know, they are buying things locally, they are investing in their families and their children. And that's because of the, the, the childcare program that we started in 2017 because we recognized how critically important it was. And I just have one more thing, Mr. Speaker 75%, 75% of the people that returned to the workforce last year were women, and it's directly attributed to our child care program. Kelowna Mission Supplemental. Well, newsflash to the minister, most of the, women who, most of the people who lost their jobs in the pandemic were women. So the fact that they're coming back to the workforce is simply because we're uh, no longer in the pandemic. And also, newsflash to the minister, with 29 additional taxes under this government, it's no wonder that things cost more. Whatever is taxed becomes more expensive. It's because of this NDP government that BC faces the highest inflation since the 80s, the largest deficit in BC history, and the pain reality of declining real incomes. The NDP has maxed out the provincial credit card and has nothing to show for it. In the last quarter, interest payments on the NDP ballooning debt spiked to nearly 100 million more than forecast. And all British Columbians, including our kids and grandkids, are left stuck with the bill. How much more do British Columbians' paychecks need to shrink before the finance minister finally ends the NDP's crippling middle-class squeeze? Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just need to put some numbers on the record. So an average family with two kids 
earning $100,000 in this province used to pay $7,473 in taxes under that former government. They now pay $4,948, authority for 34% decrease, a 34% decrease. Speaker, if you made $80,000 with two kids, you used to pay $5,637 in taxes. You now pay $2,458, a 56%, a 56% tax reduction. I mean, it's and again, $30,000 they used to pay taxes. Now, now they pay $177 members, in taxes, members. and or that's what they used to pay. Now they get $2,500 back, Mr. Speaker. You know, I could go on. What they used to do. For Mr. Speaker. The bell and question period.